I mean, good morning. good morning. Welcome to Riceville Valley Community Church. I'm honest to goodness so used to saying, welcome to our virtual service. This, it's like, it's like lot, you know, they say it takes three weeks to form a habit, and I've, I've got one already. So, so far two weeks, and I have not said virtual service. I'm working on it. Um, a couple of announcements. Uh, one is thank you to those who, who helped with, with Billy's uh, memorial yesterday, um, and just on behalf of the McAllisters, but myself included, thank you. Uh, as you go out today, there are some, some little treat bags there with some yummies and some flower seeds that you can plant, so please uh, take one on your way out. Uh, also, uh, I believe Jacob is contacting systematically all of the parents trying to figure out if some time with the youth would work out. And what he's trying to plan is some outdoor activities. So if he contacts you, make sure you get, get a hold of him and talk with him because maybe even as soon as this Wednesday, I don't know. Uh, but also, uh, and then I have a, a prayer request for myself. Um, sometimes you do things and you look back and you say, maybe I was a little overzealous. And I, uh, I have, I'm teaching a course, this, or workshop, this Thursday evening with our denomination on technology and the small church after COVID-19. Why did I do this? I'm going to say it was a Spirit of the Lord moment, because at this moment, I don't know why I did this. But anyways, I'll ask, would you be praying for me on Thursday night? Because we've had a series of workshops for small churches that we're doing, and they've been excellent. And uh, if I would have known this was going to be the last one, I would have been like, put me earlier, put me earlier, don't make me the cleanup hitter. Um, but please be praying for that. As a, I, th I think it's going to be kind of exciting to see what small churches are doing. And small churches in the EPC really need your prayer right now. Um, the last one we had was on finances. There are a lot of churches on the brink, if not already beginning to close their doors, financially speaking. And... Uh, this has been just one of the hard realities of this season. So please be praying for churches. Um, that being said, uh, are there any other announcements this morning? Okay. Well, then, friends, I want to invite you this morning to uh, stand and be called to worship. The Spirit of the Lord is upon us. The Spirit of the Lord is in us, anointing us, sending us to bring good news, to bind up, to proclaim favor, to comfort, to provide, to loosen. The day of the Lord is coming. The day of the Lord has come. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that this day, this day we celebrate. Uh, it's actually Trinity Sunday that you are infinitely and graciously loving us, walking with us, helping us, providing for us. And when we say that the day of the Lord has come, we completely understand what that means, that Christ, you have come. Christ, you have, you have made all things new and are making all things new and will one day complete that. And we have just gratitude in our hearts as we live in that every single day. Lord, may everything we do, say, sing, think, and pray be glorifying to you this morning. Christ, it's in your name we pray this. Amen. Friends, let's remain standing as we sing, O Worship the King.
Please be seated. Let's now go into a, a time of prayer, of confession. Lord, the word that pops out as we finish that song is our Redeemer. You've redeemed us. It's done. It's happened. And yet, Lord, every person in here knows that we are not completely living in redemption. Lord, how can it be? How can we struggle, as Paul says, that we do the very things we know not to do? And Lord, your answer to that is to come to you and confess and keep accepting that redemption. Be transformed by redemption over and over and over and repent towards that redemption. And so, Lord, we come to you this morning not because you want to... <laughs> accuse us and shame us, but because the work of redemption that's happening in us this very day counts on it. So, Lord, we ask because we ache to be redeemed fully, even in this life. Would you hear now our silent prayers of confession? Let's turn now to the confession that's on the screen. Join me. Heavenly Father, when the world is in turmoil and our hearts feel conflicted, we confess our need of you. We confess the difficulty in knowing what to do. We confess that we often just hope the problems will resolve and go away. But we believe your word when it says, that we have not been given a spirit of fear and timidity. So instead, Father, give us a clear view of your guidance and call to be the image of Christ in times of turmoil. Holy Spirit, gift us as the people of God to be the feet who carry the good news of the gospel of peace. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. Friends, the good news of the gospel is that Christ is the King, that He's the Lord. Um, I know that we're in one of those seasons where things are hard and things are challenging. And I think one of the challenges that comes on us is, what do I do? And we're going to talk about that today, but we're going to find that what we do is we declare that Jesus Christ is the Lord. He is the Lord of all of it. And in Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Friends, let's continue in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we come to you knowing that it is in you. We have everything we need, everything we need. But Lord, we do confess that there are people on our hearts, situations on our hearts, Lord, that we ache to see you enter into. Lord, would you hear now the prayers of your people? Lord, we do ask for peace in the country, and we do ask for wisdom for our leaders. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Yeah, Lord, we do. We, we ask that, and we ask that, Lord, just in your, in your gracious name. Lord, in our mercy, hear our prayers. Mm -hmm. 
Lord, we do thank you for this church, and we do thank you for the, the witness and the people and what you're calling us to as really as, as that, that missional outpost in Riceville, Lord. Um, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Heavenly Father, we give you this, the days and weeks ahead. Um, Lord, I think our hearts long for this season to be over with, um, and it just feels like it's dragging out. It's getting hot outside. Things are slowing down. And yet, Lord, I ask that you would help us to see what you're doing and what you're calling us to. Lord, help us to be the church. Help us to be those feet that bring good news. Lord Jesus, help us to love our neighbors and help us to love you in this season. It, it's hard, Jesus, and I confess that. It is hard to stay focused and to stay present. But Lord, that's my prayer for each one of us. Help us to stay focused. Lord, we pray for those who are traveling this weekend. Lord, we pray for those um, who are at home. We pray for those, Lord, who are in facilities and don't even have the option. Lord, we're grateful. We're grateful for what you're doing in your people. We yield to you. We look to you. We long for you. Lord, we do give you our leaders. We give you those who are tasked with enormous decisions, with the weight that we could never imagine. Father, be the one to hold them up, sustain them. Lord, we thank you for um, those who are serving you around the globe trying to be those feet that bring good news. Lord Jesus, thank you for them. Bless their work. Bless them and take care of them. We pray all this in the way that you taught your disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, the peace of the Lord be with you all. Once again, don't move. Don't move. Okay, well, um, last week we decided that it would be easier if I preach without a mask on because apparently it's hard to understand what I'm saying. I think it's because you don't want a ninja preaching to you. Um, we, that's our joke in our house, but that's because we're into ninjas. Um, well, this morning uh, I'm going to be looking at Isaiah 61 a little bit more in depth, uh, which we used for our call to worship and it's, uh, this is really one of those, past, I just, I've just slowly been going through Isaiah um, over, over COVID. <laughs> and uh, it's a good one to go through when you don't know where you're going to be for the next three months, because it's a long book. And uh, this week, I, I finished up Isaiah, but Isaiah 61 and 62 jumped off the page for me in times like this. Um, it just, I mean, it was so clear, and I just, I was like, oh my gosh. And it just was ministering to me so much, I thought, I think there's a sermon in that. And so by Jove, wrote a sermon from that. Um, so we're going to look at Isaiah 61, uh, 1 through 5. We're going to put the words on the screen. I'm actually reading the NIV version. It, it just flows a little better than the ESV ver version. So if you'll join me in the reading on the screen. This comes from, once again, Isaiah 61, 1 through, five, uh, 1 through 6. Excuse me, 1 through 6. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to pray, proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for, for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes the oil of joy instead of mourning, 
and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of His splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Strangers will shepherd your flocks. Foreigners will work your fields and vineyards. And you will be called priests of the Lord. You will be named ministers of our God. You will feed on the wealth of nations and in their riches you will boast. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Lord, we believe in the power of your word. We believe it because it is a living word. It is a word that the Spirit can use to speak directly to our hearts and our minds and transform us. And so that is our request. God, transform us through the power of your word. Father, if I have anything wise to say, let it come out. If it's not wise, let it blow away like chaff in the wind. We don't need it but your word is eternal, so let us hold to that. It's in your name we pray, Christ. Amen. Well, elephant in the room time. You ready? Here we go. This has been a hard week, y'all. This has been a hard two weeks. It has. It's, I, I, anybody in here, maybe it's just me, has lost sleep the past week or two. I'm um, watching the news, trying to understand what do you do with this? What do you do with this? Um, But as Christians, we are called to declare that Jesus is Lord. And when I look at this current situation, um, really of what uh, the, the pieces around George Floyd have sparked, I have one honest emotion. I think we're in a Kairos moment. What's a Kairos moment? It's those pregnant moments. It's those moments where God does something, right? We talk about the first one being in creation, when the Spirit is brooding over the waters. Nothing's happened yet. It's just about to happen. You know, it's, it's a pregnant moment. It's big. It's big. I, you know, I, without embarrassing my wife too much, it's that moment right before the delivery where everything is totally focused, totally right there, there, everything else kind of goes out the, out the window, unless it's your second child and you got a, a doctor that's a student and he's kind of like, right here, right here? <laughs> it's not what you want to hear. <laughs> but anyways, it, it's a, but it's that moment where everybody except that guy is, is, is waiting for something amazing to happen. That's a, I think that's where we're at. Um, I've, I've been really excited because our denomination is... is responding in very similar ways. They have worked tirelessly these last two weeks to try to resource people with what do we do now? Um, But that's a great question, is it? What do we do now? What do you do now? What do I do now? Um, And I think that's where most of us get stuck in situations like these. We don't know what to do. It's, it's what I, I think Martin Luther King really described as the difference between the ought and the is. He says, we make our fervent pleas for the high road of justice, and then we tread unflinchingly the low road of injustice. This strange dichotomy, this agonizing gulf between the ought and the is represents the tragic theme of man's earthly pilgrimage. <laughs> I thought that was a pretty honest leveling um, but the truth in it is, is this, is I think when we get to these moments where things are, are, are hard, hectic, scary, turbulent, we get paralyzed. And we go, what does somebody like me do in a moment like this? I know there's something we should do, but what is it? I am not going to preach a political sermon today. Um, one, I'm just I'm terrible at it. It's just an, doesn't work for me, and two, I'm not a big fan of them anyways, so it's just better to stay away. What I am going to preach is a practical sermon this morning. I'm going to try to answer that question, what does somebody like you and me do in times like these? And I think the way we approach this is through the lens of the redemption narrative in Jesus Christ. That is, that all of history has been a slow work of redemption since the Garden of Eden. And we are in a particular place right here and right now. 
Our passage this morning comes from Isaiah, Isaiah 61. It's a messianic prophecy. What's a messianic prophecy? It's prophecy about Christ, right. And why is this messianic prophecy maybe a little bit more famous than most? I know. Because Jesus quotes it himself. You remember this in Luke 4? He's just come back from the wilderness. He goes straight into the synagogues, begins teaching. He walks up, looks at the scroll of Isaiah, starts rolling and rolling and looking, and then he comes across Isaiah 61, and he reads it for them. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives. And then he closes it. Do you remember what he says after that? Yeah. He says, in your hearing, this scripture has now been fulfilled. As far as the gospel of Luke goes, I think that is probably the most telling moment that Jesus gives throughout the gospel. If, if, just in case you're wondering, that's me. That's what he says. I'm the guy. I'm the guy. Because like most messianic prophecies, there's a current context and a new covenant context, right? The current context of Isaiah 61 is Isaiah prophesying about the Israelites coming back from the Babylonian captivity, right? Isaiah has kind of three different works of prophecy. It's before the captivity, during the captivity, and what's going to happen after the captivity. That's 56 through 66. I, I love it when... Old Testament scholars say, oh, it couldn't have, you know, that couldn't have been Isaiah that wrote that. How would he have known? And then we say, that's why we call it prophecy, because he didn't know. He had to listen to God to get it. So anyways, that's, that's the context he's writing in. But with all Messianic prophecy, it has two contexts, right? The current and the new covenant context. And who is the new covenant context of Isaiah 61? It's Jesus, and he says it for him, just in case you're wondering, yeah, that's me. I'm that guy. Typically, that's not a good thing to say, I'm that guy, but in this context, it was. I'm that guy. They didn't take it well. They tried to stone him, but uh, he got away, as you know. Um, but the picture that's being painted here is rather remarkable. It's a picture that's being painted not about the earthly Jerusalem, but the heavenly Jerusalem or Zion. Let me just read you these lines one more time. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. Riceville, do you hear the beautiful work of redemption in those words? What do we do as Christians in response? I'll tell you, Isaiah actually kind of nails it for us. He goes ahead and he, he responds because in the very next chapter, 62, he begins writing from his perspective. And listen to what he says because he gets so moved by this picture of redemption. He says, Chapter 62, verse 1, for Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not remain quiet till her vindication shines out like the dawn, her salvation like a blazing torch. And God responds to Isaiah in that in verses 6 to 7. So he says, well, I've posted watchmen on your walls, Jerusalem. They will never be silent day or night. You who call on the Lord, give yourselves no rest. And listen to this, listen to this. And give him no rest till he establishes Jerusalem and makes her the praise of the earth. In other words, God himself is saying, don't you dare cease asking me for this. Don't you dare cease asking me for this until I've established it. Whew, I'm glad I'm not wearing a mask. I, don't, I think I passed out on that one. Don't you dare cease asking me for this. We're called to yearn for this, to long, to ache 
for this kind of redemption. Don't you cease, not once, keep asking. So what do you do when moments happen in the world where it feels like, I don't think that's right. I don't think that's the redemption we're talking about. What do you do when injustice happens? I didn't get this from a book. It's just an observation. So take it for what it's worth. This is the Gospel of Josh. When injustice happens in the world, whether it's to one person, to many persons, whether it's a kid that gets picked on and bullied, whether it's an act of violence, it creates a vacuum. And if it's a big enough injustice, it creates an enormous vacuum. And it's the kind of vacuum that's a spiritual vacuum. And it will draw into itself one of two things. The response for the kingdom of God or the response for the kingdom of the enemy. This past week, I think we have witnessed both. I honestly do. I think you've seen both of them at work. How do you explain this? I'll tell you how you explain it. It's a war of two kingdoms. You've seen people respond with peaceful protest and try to make clear this cannot continue, and you've seen people respond with violence and destruction, and we know whose fingerprints those are. What do you do in moments like those? I think you have to recognize these are powerful moments in culture. These are powerful moments in the narrative of redemption. And that vacuum gets filled by one of two things. And in the New Testament, who does God use to fill that vacuum? Everybody raise your hand. <laughs> he uses the church to fill the vacuum. He uses the church to advance his kingdom. He uses his people to proclaim the good news of the gospel. And what happens if they don't fill that vacuum? I wish I could say nothing. I wish I could honestly say nothing, but I would be lying. And you'd know I'd be lying. That's the worst part, is you know I'd be lying. You'd say, Josh, I've seen history. Nothing ever happens when we just let injustice keep going. I'm going to give you a little quick backstory here. Um, it's, it's my own. Uh, I grew up in a very small white town. It's not as small as it used to be. It, they grow. Um, it's kind of remarkable. I grew up in the time where we had a Kmart. They've got Super Walmart now. Um, it's just different times. But I grew up in a small white town, and uh, my problems growing up had nothing to do with race. As a matter of fact, when I reflect on my youth, I think about, did that girl like me? How am I going to pass biology? Any other strugglers in biology in the room? Thank you. I'm glad I'm not the only biological idiot. Wait. Uh, but it wasn't until... I moved to California to go to seminary that I really encountered race and diversity. And uh, Rebecca and I met, we got married in California, and the first apartment we lived on, we were in a neighborhood of primary Latino and African American folks. Um, the funny part about that is that we kind of belonged in the neighborhood. But everybody there knew the only reason you live here, the only reason you walk on the street is because you go to Fuller, the seminary we attended. And so they'd say that. You'd walk by and they'd be like, hey, Fuller! And you'd go, hey, because they knew that you're white and so you must be from Fuller because you would not be walking here if you were not. And so it was our past. It was the way we, it was the reason we existed in our neighborhood and it was, it was fine. And I discovered in that time that even though I was surrounded by race and diversity, it still was not my problem. It didn't have to be. 
And it hasn't been until recently that I've realized that um, I don't have to personally ever deal with racism and never will. Now, I have friends that do and have told me they do. I've sat in, I sat in a tire shop not too long ago where I heard some of the worst racist language that you can utter in public. But I can just be white and walk away from it and say, well, I'm not going to engage that. <laughs> um, so what I've learned is that, therefore, I have still not made racism my problem because I don't have to. And I'm going to tell you this morning as a means of confession that I was wrong. I am wrong. Why? Because of Isaiah 61 and 62. As followers of Jesus Christ, we are called to ache, to yearn, to long, to not stop or cease asking God for redemption until it happens. Even if it's not happening to me. And this doesn't just go for African Americans. It goes for every single injustice we see under the sun, to every race, to every hurt, to every piece of brokenness that is spoken of or witnessed in our society. But every once in a while, something bubbles up and it's like, look here, no, no. We do that as Christians. We say, Lord, just give me a sign. And then he gives us one, and we'll say, how about a different one? Because I'm not really excited about dealing with that one. And yet, here it is. People are hurt. People are trying to understand why this keeps happening, why we walk through these pieces. And so, church, what do you do? Because let's be honest, it feels much bigger than us. And the truth is, it is. It's much bigger than us. But here's three very practical things somebody like you, somebody like me, can do right now. One is as Jesus followers, we take serious this charge of redemption. Uh, we hear the call to make it my problem. That could look like, based on where you're at this morning, confession, or, or reestablishing your commitment to love your neighbor, or simply just seeing this text as revelation and saying, you know what, I never think I've received the invitation to care about this before. Let the Spirit work that out in your heart. I don't know what to tell you. For me, it's honestly, there's, as you can tell, there's been a little confession and uh, maybe a little bit of all three of those. Um, second, we take to the walls and give him no rest till he establishes Jerusalem. I have never had somebody in my entire life say, don't shut up until I give it to you. That's exactly what God just says. Don't you dare shut up <laughs> until I give you this. Why? Because it's that good. Pray it into existence. That's what we do. As people who believe that prayer shapes reality, we are invited to pray things into existence. So that's what we do. We pray, and we ask for healing, and we ask for wholeness, and we ask for the kingdom to come today. If you need help with this, like I, one of the beautiful resources that our denomination, the EPC, has, epc.org, is they have an entire prayer guide of scriptures. How do you pray about this? And it's very succinct and very helpful. Tomorrow they are actually holding an entire day of fasting to pray in whatever God is doing right now. Maybe you want to join that fast. Some of you that have done food fasting, that might be a great invitation. Um, a simple fast you can do with that is just simply say, for an entire day, I'm going to kind of cut out the social media 
and I'm just going to listen to the Lord. Whatever the Lord puts on my heart, that's what I'm going to ask Him for that day. That's a form of fasting. Finally, we take small actions. Um, For some, it's having your friend that doesn't look like you over for dinner. For some, it's saying hi to that person that doesn't look like you in the grocery store. Um, For some, it might be, hey, I'm going to learn a new language just so I can communicate two honest sentences to somebody when I see them. This used to happen to me a lot in California. I'm going to warn you now. You'll say something, and then, the, and then especially this would happen with Spanish, and then they go, Bow! and then they finally look at you and go, you don't speak Spanish, do you? Yeah. No, that's right. <laughs> that's right. And, uh, but, but it's a worthy endeavor, <laughs> that being said. Um, and for some of you, it's going to mean taking your place in the public square. It's going to mean saying things, maybe even joining some of these protests, whatever that looks like. Um, I want to encourage you, if that's what your call is, find ways to do it sheerly out of love because the enemy can co op it in a heartbeat. But for all of us, when we tell the Lord, Jesus, I think I'm going to make this my problem, be prepared for the Spirit of God to open new opportunities for you that you have never seen before. New ways of walking this out, new ways of loving your neighbor that you didn't even know existed. You might even find some neighbors you didn't even know existed. Friends, this is the work of the kingdom. I think if we make it anything else, One, we're risking missing an incredible opportunity. Two, we're risking what happens when we do nothing. Ask the Lord what he's doing right now and trust him. Just trust him. That's our great inheritance is the Holy Spirit. Trust him to lead you and guide you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I feel like I have hairs on the back of my neck that are just standing straight up right now. I feel like sometimes we speak into the the void and the, the word comes back to us as your word says, not with nothing, but very much with something. And so, Lord Jesus, I pray that these words from Isaiah would be the invitation if for nothing else, to just join in the work of prayer, but maybe even more, maybe even more than that. Lord, may these words be words that inspire us to see thy kingdom come and thy will truly done. As we're about to sing, you are Lord, you are Lord, you are risen from the dead and you are Lord. Every knee will bow, every tongue confess. And that's every tongue, that Jesus Christ is Lord. God, give us a vision for that. Right where we're at, no more, no less. Jesus, we thank you that you love us. We thank you that we have infinite access to that love. And Lord, we pray that you would teach us and show us how to love one another. It's in your name we pray, Christ. Amen. As Michelle makes her way back to the piano, I want to invite you all to stand. Let us just declare that, if nothing else, we know that he is Lord.
Friends, he is life. He is life. Friends, go in the glorious reality that Jesus is the one who guides us, sustains us, helps us, walks with us, declares the good news. I know that uh, our, our postlude is about to be Amazing Grace. I think most of you all know the context to Amazing Grace. I just want to encourage you. Friends, it's amazing. It's really amazing. Go in that grace. Amen. One other thing, by the way, I know that uh, anytime we talk about really fun stuff, it stirs up thoughts, concerns, uncertainties, and potentially questions. Um, so I'm going to be outside at the end of service. If you want to talk, let's talk, please. Amen. Thank you.